All right, we're rolling. Thanks so much for, for taking the time. Oh, thanks for having me. Um, so there's, there's, like I said, there, your, your work is so broad and, and so deep. Um, if you mind just giving a little synopsis of, of, of what the focus of your work has been or become. Well, I think if I had to reduce 25 books to a couple sentences, it would be this way of living cannot last. And when it is over, I would prefer that there is more of the world left rather than less. And everything is predicated on the understanding that this culture can't be sustainable. And then we have, in, in some ways, um, my first three major books were a little bit of an informal trilogy. That was a language older than words, was really about how the culture is sort of psychologically irredeemable, how uh, there are, we have an entire culture really suffering from post-traumatic stress disorder. And, and as a consequence, we have some difficulty establishing good relationships, not only with each other, but with the rest of the planet. Mm -hmm. um, then culture make-believe was, so this first one is like, how do you make yourself sane in a crazy culture? And then culture make-believe was kind of about um, once you have made yourself somewhat sane in this crazy culture and you look around, what do you see? And another way to look at it is that that book was about how um, the culture's social reward system rewards behavior that benefits individuals at the expense of the group and therefore will harm groups, harm communities, harm natural communities. It's based on, it's, it's really, Culture Make Believe was supposed to be a five page introduction to an encyclopedia of hate groups. And I asked, what is a hate group? And then the book exploded from there. And really one of the central ideas where it came to was that we, if you have a way of life that's based on competition, it will lead inevitably to hatred. Because um, if you and I are in competition over something and I want to cheat, I really want to gain an advantage, then it can help to to dehumanize you, to depersonalize you, to to make you less than. And so if you have an entire culture that's based on that sort of competition, you're going to end up with some consequences of that, which would include very strong racism, um, of course, hatred of women. It's going to make hatred of anybody that you're competing with, ultimately, when it's a dog-eat-dog -dog world. When you have a selfish gene world, you're going to try to exploit as much as you can, and then you're going to, <clears throat> excuse me, you're going to try to rationalize that exploitation by creating religions, <clears throat> philosophies to support it. One of my favorite lines from, excuse me, <clears throat> excuse me, one of my favorite lines from the culture make believe was um, any hatred felt long enough no longer feels like hatred. It feels like economics or philosophy or religion or just the way things are. And then the third book of that informal trilogy was Endgame, where the first book is, how do you make yourself sane in a crazy culture? The second book is, once you make yourself sane and you look around, what do you see? And the third book is, what are you gonna do about it? And that book, another approach I had in that is, another way to say it is that if a language all the words was about how psychology, psychologically this culture is messed up, and then Endgame, or culture make-believe was sociologically how it's not sustainable, then, I wanted to approach the same material from a different angle. So I talked about it in terms of resource movement, that if any way of life requires the importation of resources must be based on violence, because if you require the importation of resources and the people in the next watershed over won't, give, won't trade you for the resource, you'll take it. Right. So we all, that book was really about how material, analysis is more important than personal change. And personal change, of course, is really important personally, but personal change doesn't equal social change. You and I can be the nicest people in the world and the United States would still have to have a huge military because they have to, they, they require access to resources and you have to have a military to get them. And if you want those resources, you're gonna to have to build the infrastructure that's gonna get them to you. Right, right. Um, so in some ways, that's, that's a central part of the work. And then, um, and then everything else is sort of uh, 
exploring eddies, you know, exploring, exploring tributaries of, of that larger work. Yeah. And that's, that's one of the things um, I love about your work so much is, is you go from macro to micro and you go from personal to social and political and anthropological and psychological. Um, and it is, and, and even, even the, relig the religious undertones, and it's amazing how it all weaves together and how tricky to even detangle it, you know, and, and, um, and a lot of what you're talking about, there's, you know, our culture, but then there's just the broader civilization, you know, and, and there's been many civilizations throughout time and history, and a lot of them follow a lot of the same paths. Of, of like you're talking about of, of uh, movement resources and the violence that comes with that and you know the, the slavery that seems to be necessary for anything to call a civilization um, and it's um I mean it's, it's 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 there's so much it's overwhelming in some regards it's also you know breath of fresh air in, in, in many regards but to realize that our whole Consciousness, our whole cosmology has been shaped, by, you know, by these things, by the perpetuation of, of these systems. Um, like I said, religiously, psychologically, familially, you know. Um, so, if I can, um, so one of the things that that I wanted to to, to talk to you about with that is is um, quite a bit about the death urge and, and how this culture has a death urge and and um, you know, to uh, elaborate on that, if you want, you know, there's very, very concrete examples of that. And it's also, I think there's, there's a, I don't know it's a paradox, but it, it seems to me the same time of that, the root of that is our separation of ourselves from death, from the natural process of life and death. And so, you know, you know we create a death urge in, in the wake of, of, the, of the culture and civilization, but it, Psychologically, some of the root of that is to separate our own selves from the natural, you know, uh, uh, the, the, you know, living and struggling and suffering and hopefully mating and then dying and being eaten by others and forgotten forever, you know. And there's almost this like search for immortality in a sense, you know. Um, I said, but in order to separate ourselves from death, we have to separate ourselves from life. Hell of a trade-off. You know, and so over and over time, we separate ourselves from nature and the life force. Um, curious, um, you know, how that how that resonates with you? Oh, I agree with everything you're saying, and um, I'm really glad you asked that question because I think um, <clears throat> if you know, I said earlier that that my work, you know, if it were going to be summed up, it would be that this way of life can't last. I prefer there's more life left on the planet. But if you were to ask a different question, which is, what is in my work that is in not a lot of other environmentalist work? Um, I would say it's the, the recognition that this culture does have a death urge and that also it's, um, that a lot of our decisions are not based on reason, reason discourse but instead a lot of our decisions are driven by unconscious urges, uh, which I don't believe are, are biological, but instead cultural. Um, I don't believe that every species has a death wish. I don't believe that every human has a death wish. Um, what I believe is that Years ago, I was interviewing Richard Drennan, who wrote Facing West, a uh, very, very good book um, about, um, well, it doesn't really matter. What matters is, is one of the things he said, which was that if a woman can create life, and I, as a man, can kill her, who is the stronger? And there is this, and he was not saying that positively. He was saying that that's a central, a central problem of patriarchy is, you know, it's, it's not like um, um, Freud said about there being this penis envy. I think it's actually a womb envy. Mm -hmm. That there is um, just, 
one of the points I made in my book, The Myth of Human Supremacy, is I talked about how what, when you think of a great piece of art, and I'm not blaming you or any listeners, it's also true for me. When I think of a great piece of art, I might think of the Mona Lisa or the Sistine Chapel or why is it that the first thing that comes to my mind is not a sunset or frog song or the sound of a meadowlark or uh, trees turning color in the fall? Why is that not? And part of the problem, or another way to say this is to ask, uh, who discovered or invented antibiotics? I know we all think it's Fleming, you know, with this big experiment, or, you know, some people can say, well, you know, knights during the Crusades would sometimes put uh, bread on their wounds. So they discovered it. And there's also stories about stable boys who would put pieces of bread under a saddle to keep the horses from getting infected saddle sores. So obviously <laughs> they invented it. Well, no, actually, um, fungus invented it. And when I, I saw this list of the 10 greatest inventions of all time, uh, and they were things like gunpowder and the cotton gin or, you know, whatever they were, a wheel, I don't know. And I was thinking, what about sex? Um, how about proprioception? You know, the ability to know where your hand is, yeah. could never move without it. And um, how, about, how about the miracle of oxygenated blood? How about opposable digits? How about cloth? How about a digestive system? How about snot? Snot's an amazing thing. Um, it's a, it's, it's an extraordinary way to keep, uh, invaders from getting in on some, well, how about skin? That's an amazing invention to keep, to keep all sorts of viruses and bacteria who want to get into you from getting in. So those don't count as inventions, just like frog song doesn't count as a song because we only value what we create. Several years ago, maybe 10 years ago now, I heard someone ask an astronomer uh, why we need to explore Mars. And he said to answer that most important question of all, which is, are we all alone? To which I was thinking, is he nuts? <laughs> because we have this beautiful, wonderful planet full of life, and he thinks we're all alone? And It's almost so, tragic. What? It's almost tragic. Well, it is tragic, and it's tragic in the classical sense of a tragic flaw, which is narcissism um, and in sociopathy and the inability to perceive others as fully existing, which yeah. is leading to the tragedy of the murder of the planet, which is in this tragic perspective foreordained, just like, just like in All My Sons or Oedipus or Hamlet or any other tragedy. You have this tragic flaw that... Uh, is more important to the protagonist than is a positive outcome to the story. So it is, it is classically tragic. Um, in any case, um, the death urge, I think, comes in great measure because, well, I was going to say, again, you know, they get so excited when they can create some amino acids in a laboratory, and that counts. And they say, we're almost on the edge of making life. It's like, bunnies do that every day. <laughs> and, but that doesn't count. And so my, my point having to do with the death urge is, I think that one of the things with patriarchy is there is this, this complete envy of the fact that women um, care, women create life inside of them. And and there is this, this, and that is not within control. And what, what a, both a patriarchal version of the world and also a, someone who has been profoundly abused 
they were someone who's been very profoundly abused for very good reasons needs to control their surroundings because the world is so terrifying. And I am not blaming a child who attempts to control everything they can. I'm not blaming that child at all. But the problem is those patterns get put in place and then what made perfect sense within the context of this abusive situation, once you get into a non-abusive situation, that's no longer appropriate behavior. But the patterns have been set, and so one can attempt to control everything around one, which we see managing forests, we see um, damming rivers, we see you know, men controlling women's reproductive functions. Um, we see this on every level. And that's one level of this. And then I want to jump a different direction. And anybody who's read any of my books knows that this is what I do. But um, years ago, decades ago now, I was interviewing Luis Rodriguez, who wrote Gang Days in L.A., La Vida Loca. Really good book about his, his autobiography about how he was a gang member in Los Angeles and he got out through the literature of revolution. And one of the questions I asked him is, why do so many of these kids stand on street corners shooting at mirror images of themselves? And he said, because there are many reasons. One, cops set them against each other. One, I mean, this is a competitive capitalist society. And one of them is that one of the reasons they shoot at mirror images of themselves is because they want to die. And the reason they want to die is because they are teenagers. And teenagers are supposed to die because you have to die as a child to become an adult. And the central metaphor of all life is death and rebirth. But so they have this impulse, but nobody has told them that this death is supposed to be spiritual and metaphorical and not physical. So they have the impulse and they don't know how to get past it. And so they enact it on a physical level when there should be social meets in place, rituals, uh, stories that teach them, yeah, you know, you're feeling like you got to die. That's because, my friend, you are the butterfly or the caterpillar going into a cocoon. And it's really painful and it stinks, but it's part of life and you got to go through it, buddy. And so that's another reason that we as a culture have a death urge is we recognize is nobody is telling us that this transformation that should be happening in this way of life should be happening metaphorically and spiritually. And of course it should change material reality, but that involves a metaphorical and spiritual and emotional and psychological change. And so instead that gets enacted in a way that ends up killing the planet. That's another reason that this culture is, is killing the planet. Another reason it's killing the planet is because, and another manifestation of the death urge is that I love Lewis Mumford's analysis of how a technology does not emerge in a vacuum. So that the Talawa, on whose land I now live, did not invent uh, um, refrigerators. And the reason they didn't invent refrigerators is not because they were too stupid, it's because their mindset did not lead them to invent it. And I mean, the the salmon stays fresher in the river anyway. So his point was that a technology doesn't exist by itself. Instead, it emerges from and leads to a certain mindset. And once you get, and, and then he broke technologies down, or tech, he would call the, the, the mindset and the technology itself, he would call it technic, T-E-C-H-N-I-C. And he said technics can be either authoritarian or democratic. Democratic ones would emerge from and lead to democratic power structures. Authoritarian ones would emerge from and lead to authoritarian power structures. And a great example of a democratic technique might be basket weaving, because anybody can learn how to do it. Nobody can restrict your access to grass or reeds. And so there's no, I'm not saying there's not skill. I'm not saying that there's not a uh, particular talent, uh, experience. But what I'm saying is, Nobody can, nobody can keep you from accessing it. Or a club, you know, anybody can 
pick up a stick and bonk somebody else on the head. But a gun, you have to have a mine. You have to have a guano mine or however else you're going to get the gunpowder. You have to have another mine for the bullets. And so if somebody can control your access to a, a metal mine, a lead mine for the bullets, then all you have is a fancy club. And if you're going to have automobiles, you need to have the entire system of mines. Oh, I was, I was getting interviewed by this guy a few years ago. This cracked me up. Uh, he was a dedicated Marxist who believed that, um, who believed that it was possible to have an industrial society with only voluntary exchanges. I said, great, do you have cities? He said, yep. I said, how, I said, how do the people get around the cities? He said, by bus. I said, what do you make the bus of? He said, metal. I said, great, where do you get the metal? He said, mine. I said, how do you get people to go on the mines? He said, well, you pay them. I said, well, mining, of course, was one of the first ones of slavery because it's such a horrible way to live. He said, well, you pay them a lot. I said, well, okay, I'll give you that. But every hard rock mine that has ever existed has poison groundwater and rivers. So what about the people who live next to the river? He said, you pay them to move. I said, what if they won't move? He said, well, you pay them more. I said, what if they've been living there for 5,000 years and their ancestors are buried on the soil next to the river and so they refuse to move? He said, how many are there? I said, well, what difference does it make? Let's say there's 400. He said, well, the million people in the city vote and they vote that those 400 people have to be kicked off their land. I said, so you have gone in less than a minute from all voluntary exchanges to democratic empire, land theft from indigenous people, and genocide, all so you can have a bus. And the point is that not only do the authoritarian techniques require authoritarian power structures, they also take over society. These days, are cities designed for human beings or for automobiles? It's crazy. Or look at global warming. It's, I mean, this, it, 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 there, are, there are people, mainstream people who are talking about how humans may go extinct. Now, I mean, never mind the rest of the planet. They're talking blithely about humans may go extinct and, and yet, they won't question the economy. They won't question. The economy still ends up being more important. The economy's in charge. And that's crazy. And when you have an entire world being turned into machines, I used to know this guy who, who would tell a joke quite often, which is, uh, as the machines are destroying the last life on Earth, they say to the human beings, uh, we had you from the toaster. <laughs> it's just, once you put in place that logic where even a lot of climate change activists, most climate change activists say, explicitly they're trying to save civilization. All the so-called solutions to global warming that are put forward, they take industrial capitalism as a given. And the natural world is happening to conform to industrial civilization. And that's insane, literally, in terms of being out of touch with physical reality. Because without a planet, you don't have any social system whatsoever. So mm -hmm. the planet has to be more important than the social system. So there's a whole bunch of levels at which this culture is, is manifesting its, its death urge. We could do five interviews by itself just on the death urge, whether we want to go you know, with the, the sort of PTSD aspects uh, and people being driven out of their bodies for the patriarchal aspects, which are those are interlinked, the sociological aspects. I mean, really, in many ways, almost all of my work has been about exploring this culture's. And, you know, really, in many ways, you know, the people will ask me how I became politicized. And, and part of my politicization was that my father was really, was extremely violent. And I was asking as a child, and I wasn't so precocious, I was using this language, but I was asking emotionally the question, if his behavior isn't making him happy, why is he doing it? And in some ways, that's a question that has, has been central to all of my work, which is if 
wiping out sea life is not making us happy. Why are we doing it? Even if we're making happy, making us happy, it wouldn't be okay. But it's not even making us happy. Um, so, so that's you know there there are so many more directions we can go. I hope that that this has been a little bit helpful. My sort of rambling on this. That was great. It's great, but it's yeah. There's so many threads. I mean, what you I mean what you were just describing about. People, people are talking about the, the, the possible inevitable demise of humanity and looking at the socio-political economics causing that. It, it reminds me of just what you're talking about with the gangbangers, you know, acting out that death urge and not realizing it's metaphorical or, or, or recognizing what is it that needs to die. It's, it, it might, you know, hopefully it may be humanity, but it may just be this way of, of living. Um, it'd be nice if it wasn't humanity, but maybe not, who's to say? <laughs> well, I would prefer that it wasn't humanity. I mean, every cell in my body wants for there to be some sort of transformation, but, but I mean, if it's a choice between industrial, well, industrial civilization can't continue. And I, I mean, all I know is that my loyalty is to, is to the natural world. Yeah. And it has to be. It has to be because the natural world is the source of all life. Without a natural world, we don't have any life. Yeah. It's just, it, 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 see, that's part of the thing that just, that, you know, I mentioned earlier that another thing about my work is that it's, it's, it, it really is based on, it has an undercurrent of the understanding that we don't generally make decisions based on recent discourse. And that whole thing about, the planet. I mean, none of none of the stuff I write about is particularly cognitively challenging. I mean, I really my my environmental awakening was really in second grade when they put in a subdivision next to where I live, and I remember thinking that you know, I mean, all the meadows disappeared and the they got turned into white box houses and all the the garter snakes went away and the butterflies and the grasshoppers and whippoorwills. And I'm not sorry, I'm with oils, uh, metal larks and uh, cottonwood trees. And I remember thinking, this can't go on forever. And I didn't have this language. I did have the language of this can't go on forever, but I didn't, ha I didn't have the language of you can't have infinite growth on a finite planet. That's, that's I, I, I don't, I've written 25 books about it. It still doesn't make any sense to me how anybody can, can believe you can have anything you know if you have uncountable salmon and then you have 10 million salmon and then you have 5 million salmon and then you have 1 million and then you have 500,000 you have 100,000 it doesn't take a genius to figure out that that's a trend going down and I don't it's the same with what toxifying you know there, there there are flame retardants in every mother's breast milk i don't understand why people aren't running screaming i remember hearing i didn't interview her i just heard her say this like in a speech i was listening to on the radio decades ago god i can't remember who it was she's a canadian toxicologist who has since passed away um anyway she said that if there were any archaeologists in the future or if there were you know somebody was able to look at this and, and decipher it they would basically see natural processes, natural processes, natural processes, and then a layer of plastics and poison, and then no more artifacts of humans. Yeah. And I, I don't, or, you know, the whole, I'm sorry, I'm jumping again, but the whole discussion of, of plastics kind of kills me too, because everybody gets so worried about plastics in the ocean, and plastics are dreadful. I mean, I, I wrote, a good portion of what we leave behind was about plastics and they're they're dreadful yes and people pretend that they're worried about them but if a fungus or a bacteria evolve that could eat plastic at the speed at which it needs to be eaten to save the oceans well, that would be great as long as it only ate the trash plastic. But if it started eating the plastic, the good plastic, the plastic we want, 
oh my God, it's eating my laptop. Oh my God, it's eating my steering wheel. What we would do, we as a culture would do is invent something right away that the bacteria couldn't eat. And it comes back to the, and then we'd have the same problem again. Because what we want is something that doesn't decay. And what we want, and this ties back to all of it too, that um, the problem is that we don't perceive, it's like you said, we aren't aware of the cycles of life. We're not, we, there's, Frederick Turner wrote this book uh, called Beyond Geography. And in there, he talks about how one of the problems is that Christianity is a linear religion as opposed to cyclical. Mm-hmm. You have a beginning and then you have an end of the world. You have a Messiah who will come and bring this all away as opposed to a world, I mean, as opposed to a religion that's based on cycles, based on every year is the same. Every, every year, I am an individual moving through this space that is reliable and a religion that reinforces that understanding. And if you have a religion that has a beginning, middle, and end, you're going to have a culture that has a beginning, middle, and end. And it's going to end, and it was all laid out in the Bible. If you have this, see, there's another part of this whole death wish, is that we have this culture created a sky god who the divinity is out there. And that was the heavy lifting, was to take the divinity surrounds us all the understanding that that the divine lives in that tree and that tree and this plant right here and this plant and in you and in me and take that and move that divinity out to a spot out somewhere in the middle of Orion's belt or somewhere way out there then it's really easy for the enlightenment to come along and say there's no meaning in the world whatsoever it's a strange thing when you look at it from a distance you know that one i mean i don't know i don't know how anybody could choose that or if that just got degraded over time but you know to to, to go from everything being alive and being part of mine and you know and the, the just the dance of life and then to go to the divine is somewhere else made hopefully we're good enough to not suffer for eternity when we die. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Um, I don't, I don't remember where I was going with that. Um, sorry, sorry to interrupt. <laughs> I, 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 I was lost before you said anything. So go ahead and just ask another question. Or sure. same question. Well, I mean, part of what you were part of what you were talking about with that is is the kind of inherent disembodiment of sky god religion, you know, longer essential okay. religion. Another part of it is that, I mean, if I had to use just one word for our culture, it might be narcissistic. It might be sociopathic, but it might be narcissistic, in that everything is based on how things. Everything has to come to us. I don't know if you've noticed this, but almost every article about species going extinct has to come back to how it's going to affect the economy or sometimes they'll say how it's going to affect humanity. Oh, I just saw this thing the other day. This makes me so angry. Um, It was uh, insects around the world are dying off and this may affect humans ability to feed ourselves. It's like I'm a cannibal. And uh, I'm also, you know, I'm a mass murderer and cannibal, and I got to watch out because I'm eating so many neighbors that I might not be able to feed myself soon. Like, right. what about them? What about their own existence? Insects have existed for a lot longer than we are, and they're a lot more important to the world than we are. And I don't, everything has to come back to us, and this is true even with our death processes, you know, that when we die, we have to be poisoned. And I understand that there are reasons for that if you live in a city, because there are, there are health reasons for it, but that doesn't alter the fact, oh, here's a better example, is 
several years ago when I lived in Spokane, Washington, 20 years ago, there was a guy who murdered his daughter and then took her body and left it in the woods. And the, the, she was eaten by coyotes or she was chewed up. And the judge got really mad at the guy, in part because he killed his daughter. And yeah, I, I, I fully believe he should go to prison for the rest of his life or get, I don't care. He's, she could execute or something. That's not the point. The point is that the judge got really, really mad at him because you left her out there to be eaten by wild animals. That's what's supposed to happen. I mean, yeah. when, when I die, I would much, I, what I really want to have happen is I just want to be left outside for the bears. And, yeah. and that's giving back. And that's what everybody does. That's how the world became so wonderful and rich and fecund and full of life in the first place is that salmon would make the world a better place by just their lives and deaths. They come into a forest, they, they have their babies, and then they die and that feeds the forest. And um, bears eat the salmon and then they walk a ways away and they poop and that helps the forest. And they kill some Douglas firs and that helps the forest because otherwise Douglas firs would run over everything because they grow faster than some of the other trees. And then the bears die and then somebody eats them. And that's how it's, that's how it's worked forever. That's since the beginning of life. And mm -hmm. we, we take and we don't give back. And, and that's not a plan with the future. I, I, that's another part of this cognitive dissonance I don't understand is if you have 16 feet of topsoil and then you have 12 feet and then eight feet and then four feet and then two feet and then six inches and we know where this heads. And I just, I don't, Again, with all the books. Oh, so, so that's, that's where I came to this understanding that we don't make a lot of our decisions based on recent discourse, if you will. Um, it can be very rational. I love a line by uh, somebody was describing Hitler. They said from insane premise to monstrous conclusion, Hitler was coldly icily logical. And that's true all across the board. But if your premise is that saving this economy is more important than saving life on the planet than all of your answers. You can be logical from that point forward, but, um, you know, that's, that's, so one, that's another part of my work is I really attempt to get myself and to other people to question premises. Um, part of that, is I think that I, I mean I didn't really like getting a degree in physics but but I think it was helpful for sort of rigorous thinking mm -hmm. the other part is honestly some of it's just personality because I have my entire life you know there, there are multiple forms of intelligence and one form I have never had my entire life was rote memory mm -hmm. and so I have had to compensate for that and I remember specifically on a lot of tests in college uh, in science classes, I would not be able to remember the formula. And so what I would do every time is derive them from first principles. And I'm, I'm not saying I'm smart for doing that. In fact, I'm doing it to compensate for an inability to just remember. I, I did the exact same thing actually in math until it stopped working for me before college, but I did the same thing, um, derive it during the test. Well, and that was a, this is probably more detail than, people, detail than people want, but that was a problem I had in the advanced physics is that when you get to the advanced physics, you can't do that in the test time. And so, um, <laughs> so there are some advanced physics classes uh, in which I can generously say that I floundered um, because I, I had such trouble. Anyway, the point is, it's the same here. But I think it's really important to examine one's premises and to uh, to try as much as possible to go back to first principles. And in the case of the plant, the first principles are that what is the source of life? It's the planet. And if 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 your way of life is harming the planet, like something I'm sure we've all heard. I heard this a lot when I was a, when I was a baby activist in the early '90s. I would I would often hear that and right, read in the newspaper. We have to balance the needs of the economic system with the needs of the environment. We have to balance, yeah. We have to balance the needs of the environment and the economic system. And 
even the first time I heard that, I thought, wow. So what that is, is that's explicitly acknowledging that the needs of the economic system are in opposition to the needs of the natural world, which means that your economic system is destroying the natural world, which means your economic system can't last. And I'm sorry, I'm not that smart. Why could I think of this? And why didn't the journalist who wrote it think of it? Every single journalist who wrote it, why didn't any of them think of it? It's, 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 so my, there are multiple points here. One of them is we need to examine premises. Another is that we get blinders put on that, uh, I love the word rationalize. Rationalize, well, it has two meanings. One of them is, you know, rationalizing bad behavior. Mm -hmm. But that's not really what I'm talking about right now. The other, the other term is like rationalizing processes. That's, that's uh, Frederick Winslow Taylor uh, came through and he was able to dramatically change business because he, he rationalized our processes. And what rationalized means in that case is ignoring everything except for the desired outcome. So it's eliminating all extraneous movement. So if somebody's working at McDonald's, there have been people who have studied what are the ideal movements for people to make so they don't have to do any extraneous movements so they can flip as many burgers as possible. And that's great if you're trying to design a machine, but that's not how communities work. And that, 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 that's central to the whole scientific process in that what you do is you come up with a theory, you, know, you observe, you come up with a theory, and then you try to rationalize, not in the bad sense, in, in, the, in the sort of the value neutral sense, you try to take into a laboratory, reduce all the variables but one, that's getting rid of all extraneous variables, and then you expand that back out of the world. And that's a very, very, very powerful way to learn things and has made computers possible and has made, um, you know, I just had surgery. It made that surgery possible. It's, it makes, it, it accomplishes all sorts of, Jumping again, David Ehrenfeld in The Arrogance of Humanism talks about how because we can um, because we can achieve minor miracles like open heart surgery, then suddenly we think we can achieve major miracles like managing forests. And so Man managing forests, you said? Yeah, managing a forest. Gotcha. Um, and he also says that nature is not only more complex than we think, it's more complex than we can think. And my point is that eliminating all variables but one is an incredibly powerful tool, but like every other tool, it comes at a cost. And a, a joke I used to tell sometime is that um, Richard Dawkins said that, this is a direct quote, science bases its claims to truth on its spectacular ability to make matter and energy jump, no, no, Science bases its claims to truth on its spectacular ability to predict what will happen and when, and to make matter and energy jump through hoops on command. And that's true. You know, when we turn on the computer, we expect it to turn on. We, we predict what will happen. You know, I can unplug the, the camera and the screen goes blank. We predict what will happen. We've made matter and energy jump through hoops on command. The problem is, that that's one way to be, but let's pretend that you and I are in the same room. And let's pretend that I have a hoop. And let's pretend that I also have a gun. And I point this gun at you, and I say, on the count of three, you're gonna jump through this hoop. And if you don't, I'm gonna shoot you. Then on the count of three, you jump through the hoop, because otherwise I, I'm gonna shoot you. So, what do you know? I'm a genius because I just predicted what would happen and when they made matter and energy jump through oops on command. Right. But don't you think that by putting a gun on you and forcing you to do that, I have forever foreclosed the possibility of us being friends. Yeah. And so that's one of the things that is lost in this. And I, I want to be kind of clear about this because postmodernism has run over this whole Western culture at this point, and it's it's sort of a response to science in many ways, and it 
argues that there is no reality, but instead there are only the stories we tell about reality. And this frustrates me terribly because I think that there are a lot of critiques to be made of science, but objective reality not existing is not one of them. And um, so it frustrates me that there are very important critiques to be made of science and and a modern critique of it is that objective reality doesn't exist. And that's, that's more of this body and nature hating patriarchal sky god nonsense. Yeah. That earth isn't real. What's real is heaven out there. And it's the same with the technotopian ideals. That what's real isn't what's happening right now to real humans and non-humans. But there is this technotopia that is just around the corner. Oh my God, I just saw this article like two weeks ago that was describing what will happen if all the Green New Deal takes place. And the thing was extraordinary that uh, there's free childcare for everybody and everybody has jobs if they want them and everybody has a basic income and college is free for everybody and the world is a wonderful place. And I go back to the thing about the, that I was saying early, I'm sorry, where do you get the metal? Where do you get the brick to build the buildings? Where do you, um, let's go back to first principles. Um, it, it's nice if everybody could have universal basic income and healthcare for everybody. Where do you get the materials? And, you know, I did, I, I, I was asked to go, to go speak to the, to the board of Patagonia a couple years ago. And it was great. I didn't know what to expect because I'd heard really good things about them. I knew they were really good, but then it was, it was so, it was so great to people, so great to talk to people who love the natural world and who understand chains of supply at the same time because they're in business. Right. And so they understand that, yeah, we're making a jacket and yeah, this jacket has problems, and we can tell you where those problems are at every step of the process. And, and so many people, like especially the bright greens who talk about windmills as though they're made out of either pixie dust or they grow on trees. And um, that's not, there's a lake near Bao Tu, actually it's not a lake, it's a big tailings pond. Um, the area around Baotou, China is one of the central places for mining rare earths minerals for all that. And the place is completely wrecked, of course, because that's what mining does. Anyway, back to first principle. And that's what everything's about is, is let's, let's take it back to what is real, what's important. Right on. I, I, uh, we're getting close to, uh, to the, the hour. I don't know if you, if you, how tight you are on that, but I want to be aware of your time. We're getting, we're getting close. Um, yeah, I have to go into town in a little while. So, so you know what I would like is to um, do maybe one more question and then uh, let's do this again. That sounds fantastic. Thank you. Um, one question. Because um, you get the, you get the, we, we're going to do this again. So it's not like you only get one question in your life. Thank you. All right. We will definitely do this again. Well, let me, let me ask you, um, I mean, a little bit jumping because it hasn't been the theme of, of today, but I want to ask you about... Uh, I mean, I want to ask you about burnout and, and, and love and grief. And um, you know, I've seen a lot of folks, you know, especially, I mean, you've been in activist circles and, you know, a lot of folks that feel, you know, feel deeply connected to nature and then they learn all the stuff or they're exposed to or they're involved. And, you know, they see how just much devastation there is. And it's to keep the actual feeling of love, you know, and, and feel the pain. And, and it's just, it's a lot, it's a lot to deal with. And, and I've blown a fuse in my past and I know a lot of people who burn out and, and I, I'm sure you've had a long journey with it, but I, I'm aware that you, you go so deeply into the pain and the devastation and yet you, you seem to truly feel your love for nature. And, you know, it's just a mental thing. It's not just an idea. You, you you actually love <laughs> the ecosystem around you. I do. I do. And, um, and I, I, I walk, I walk in the forest every day and I, I try to pay my rent. Um, 
I, I uh, throw food out in the forest for all the, the refugees. And, um, and, you know, honestly, my, the, 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 the things that make me want to quit activism are, are not even how bad things are on a global scale. The things that make me want to quit activism are, um, are, are petty fights between people. And I really have such tremendous respect for Buffalo Field Campaign and for the, the people who run it. And, and one of the founders, Rosalie Little Thunder, um, told the other founders when they were first starting, you know, we're gonna spend about five or 10% of our time actually protecting Buffalo and about 90 to 95% of our time dealing with human drama. And man, it's the human drama that just makes me wanna quit. It's not, it's not even the long odds. But, and the reason I don't quit is because honestly, I'm not doing it for other environmentalists. I'm not doing this, I'm doing this for, it, it breaks my heart that I don't see as many um, redwood millipedes as I used to. And I don't see um, as many uh, rough skin newts as I used to. And I've lived here for 20 years. When I first moved here, I would see, oh, I could see a couple a day. And uh, now I see a couple a year if I'm lucky. And I've talked to old timers who remember back in the 70s seeing, they would see 100 in a day. And wow, that's what keeps me going. And what keeps me going is, is I don't, I'm a big believer in the, I don't know, you call it philosophy, theology, praxis, there we go, of Joe Hill, who when he was gonna get executed, he said, don't mourn, organize. And the way I think about this is, yeah, I know what it is to mourn. I mean, I have multiple bad diseases and I have mourned losses of my own capacity. And um, my, my mother, who was the world to me, uh, died last November. And I know what it is I know what it is to grieve, but the thing is, as my mom was dying, I was doing everything I could to make her comfortable. And if I had a family in here and somebody broke in and started killing them, I wouldn't mourn, I would fight. And then you mourn after you mourn when it's all done. And I'm not saying we shouldn't mourn the ongoing loss. What I'm saying is that if you love, you will act to defend your beloved. And I mean, in my life, and this is kind of a joke, but it's also completely true. In my life, I have been attacked by mother, I'm gonna hang, I'm gonna get this, whoa, 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 we'll back up a second. Hello? I get robocalls all the time. Anyway, um, so in my life, I have been attacked by mother horses, cows, chickens, ducks, geese, geese, uh, hawks, eagles, mice who thought that I was attacking their babies and they didn't they acted they acted and if a mother mouse can take on someone 6,000 times her size and win <laughs> then you know what excuse do we have and and I don't I'm so frustrated because it was so predictable that um, first capitalists say oh, there's not really a problem. 
and then they say, well, there's a problem, we can change it with minor fixes. And then they say, oh, there's a problem, but it's too late. And now it's time to just mourn. And it's like, wait, 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 you skipped that step in between. Yeah. And, and there is this, I mean, it's like my friend Lear Keith often says that if there's anybody alive a hundred years from now, they're going to wonder what the fuck was wrong with us. So we didn't fight like hell when the world was going down. And, and that's what you do when, when, oh, there's an, another thing I want to bring up and this is going to take us a couple more minutes, but I, it, it really helped me, um, a couple years ago, I read a book, uh, by Charles Martin. No, sorry. Back up. A couple years ago, I read a book by Charles Frazier, uh, who wrote Cold Mountain. This book was, uh, 13 Moons. And the book is a love story between this guy and this woman, which is okay. But what I loved was the book was really a love story between the protagonist and the land. And he lives in North Carolina. And he's there from, I think, about 1820 to 1900 or so. And Toward the end of the book, as he's getting old, he makes this incredibly profound point about how we are supposed to grow old and die. And as you grow old and die, your friends die, your parents die, your grandparents die, then your parents, your uncles, your aunts, your siblings, your partners, your friends. That's, that's life, that is literally life. But what we did not evolve to experience is the death of the land. And hmm. yeah, one tree would fall and more trees would come up, but the forest itself remained. And there was that stability, that solidity in your life. The, the Talawa lived where I live now for 12,500 years at least. And they could count on the salmon and they could count on the lampreys and they could count on the forest. And there is no, there is no major, we are not equipped. It doesn't really matter whether we're equipped. We, it is an atrocity. That's what I'll say. It is an atrocity. I mean, Losing my mother was the hardest thing in my life. And, and at the same time, that's life. And that's not the same as the songbirds disappearing. Because for all of our evolution, we have had that stability. And I'm not trying to make this about us because everybody else is experiencing this too, that the bears, had the salmon forever too and now they can't count on the salmon either and i don't know what point i'm making with this i just know that that there is that there's a really profound point in frazier's book having to do with what part of the reason i want to say this is because i don't want for people to be able to say well you know your mom's death was natural therefore the death of the planet is natural too and people say that, but that's not how it works. That's, <laughs> that's not how it works. There's, I love this line by Paul Stamets that nature loves a community and individuals live and die, but it's the community and the land that goes on. And that's part of what the sky God cost us too, is that that permanence was removed from and we could have a whole big discussion about that, about whether the sky god, there are those, excuse me, like uh, Paul Shepard, who talked about how the sky god really emerged because of agriculture and because agriculture was destroying the land. Hmm. And therefore, the land was no longer permanent. And to find something we can hold on to that is unchanging, we have to create this abstract being. That's interesting. I hadn't thought about that. Well, Paul Shepard and some others have written very well about that. And I mean, I, that's not original to me. Yeah. But it, 
it's some, it's some, anyway, so, so ask me one more question that I can answer with like three words that'll be like a, a rousing way to end. Three, okay. Or I can end, end with a sentence. Um, <laughs> well, um, focus on, on people since people are the ones, you know, destroying the planet. Um, I mean, within, within the system, there's the humans. There, uh, how do we fix them? Is there, is there a simple, th I mean, this is a ridiculously large question. Um, so three words will be perfect, but is there one way to, to heal humanity from this insanity? Well, that's part of the reason that I don't have a lot of optimism because it takes a lot of work. I just got a, a note from somebody yesterday saying a friend of hers is a young man who is addicted to porn and also addicted to, uh, uh, to he has a heart, he has been through abuse and through, uh, through pornography has been rewired such that uh, people have to inflict pain on him for him to get sexually aroused. And she said, he's a nice guy but he's totally into the, I mean, he's, he's, he is addicted to that. And so what, what would I suggest? And I asked a feminist friend of mine, I mean, I suggested that he, he get some therapy and he, he, but first he has to acknowledge there's a problem. And then I learned from, from, I asked a friend of mine who said that, that one of the things that, that some people talk about is people who are addicted to pornography, what they do is they take a year off from sex and, they take a year off from not just a sexual partner, not just hookups, not just, but also masturbation. And you just, you take an entire year off and you allow, you allow your brain to sort of reconfigure. And when I wrote that to, to my friend who, who had asked about her friend, she wrote back and said, well, that's a really tall order. Mm -hmm. and that's part of my problem with the notion of a voluntary transformation is if that's a tall order on one person, how tall of an order is this for? And that's not how social change takes place anyway. That social change, um, Peggy Reeves Sanday wrote about how some cultures are high, uh, high rape cultures, some are low rape cultures. And so there's predictable characteristics. Highly militarized cultures are often high rape. And um, one of the ones that was surprising was any culture that has, has a history of ecological dislocation in the last three or 400 years is more likely to be high rate. Mm -hmm. That's her, and now I'm gonna extrapolate from that. So what that says to me is that cultural transformation, you have to metabolize trauma through generations. And it takes generations to truly change a culture. And so there's not going to be a miraculous overnight. What yeah. people do individually then is, um, A, they can, they can work on their own issues, very important. And then B, they can find what they love and then defend it. And you don't have to be in perfect emotional health to do that. That's no matter what you love, it's under assault, whether it is amphibians, whether it is a specific river, whether it is women, whether it is uh, books, whether it is long form discourse, whether it's discourse at all, it's under assault. And so find something you love and then get off your butt and do something about it. And I'm not going to tell you what to do because I don't know what you love. I mean, I have a good friend, uh, Charlotte Watson, used to run a battered women's program, or she used to run a, a safe house uh, in New York for battered women. And then later she, she worked uh, for the battered women's program for the state of New York. And she, uh, she basically asks every man she sees what will it take for men to stop eating on women. And I would never tell her that she needs to stop doing that work and work on salmon issues. You know, that's why I don't tell people what to do because I know somebody who desperately loves prairie dogs. And so she fights to defend those and she doesn't work on salmon issues and other people who love mountain lions. And so find what it is that really speaks to you. And very quickly also, um, what are your gifts also? What are your gifts? 
and I'm not an organizer. People have said, quit writing, Derek, and become an organizer, but I can't even organize my pens. And also, I'm an introvert. I don't like talking to people. And so organizers have to, you know, talk to people. And I had a friend who's an organizer who said, oh, I'm not doing anything this afternoon. I think I'm going to go stand outside Walmart and leaflet. And that's, that's, that is hell to me. But for her, that's, that was a great way. That's a fun way to spend the afternoon. So what are your gifts? What do you love doing? And then what are the largest, most pressing problems that you can help to solve using the gifts that are unique to you and all the universe? So I'd have people ask those questions of themselves. Awesome. Thank you. Well, thank you so much. Yeah. I, any any uh, contact info or anything like that you want to put out or people can find you? If they... My website's uh, DerekJensen.org, D-E-R-R-I-C-K-J-E-N-S-E-N.org. And uh, um, I got a whole boatload of books out. You can get them at the library. Um, no order. Read them whatever order you want. Uh, and read. I mean, I don't care if you read my books. Read a book. Uh, books need protecting, too. Awesome. It's been a pleasure. Thank you so much. Your questions are great. Thanks.